we're going to talk a little bit about the cyclohexanes, um, about cyclohexanes specifically again today um, in a little bit more depth. And then we're going to get into um, different types of, of what are called stereoisomers. And so a stereoisomer is basically where you have everything connected in the same way, but it's still not the same molecule because the pieces, so the connections are all the same, but the pieces are arranged differently in space such that you can't get from one conformer to the other without breaking some bonds. So that the simplest example is like we were talking about at the end of class on Tuesday, where we were looking at if you have a, a ring structure, you have something, if you have two substituents on that ring structure, you can have them both on the same side of the ring, or you can have them on opposite sides of the ring. Everything can still be connected in the exact same way, but the spatial arrangement is different. And they'll call that a stereoisomer, um, usually because there's two options, either the same, same side or the opposite side, or right-handed versus left-handed. Uh, so that's where the term stereoisomer comes from. Is It basically looks like everything should be the same based on, just based on the bonds, and, um, but the physical arrangement is different, spatial arrangement. And then um, we'll take about half an hour to do some, some Excel stuff as well, looking at some of that data. Um, got, I think I've got the best workaround for, the, for Google Sheets and for the online version of Excel when it comes to making charts. It's not perfect, um, but I do have a way to get around that, um, those issues. And then the other, the other trick, um, that I'm going to show you is basically how to how to simulate finding an integral without actually finding the integral. Base, like I said before, basically doing the rectangle method with really really small delta t. If you have really really small delta t or delta x, then it's really close to actual the actual integral. Um, and it turns out that's a pretty easy calculation to do if you have a spreadsheet full of data. It's really hard to do from, and it's, it's not actually hard to do if you have a function, you just need to be able to set it up so that you have a couple thousand data points and um, and you can get a numerical answer that's not perfect, but it's close enough within sig figs for the sciences. So that's the part that the DiffEQ folks over in the math department don't like. So it's an, the difference is what's, the difference between what's called an analytical method and a numerical method. Numerical means that you've got, you get an answer, um, but it's not perfect. The analytical methods give you an exact answer. Numerical methods give you an, an answer within sig figs. Um, so that's, and most math classes in the math department really are only concerned with analytical answers. You have to go to an engineering department or a physics department or a chemistry department before you start learning about numerical methods. Um, because a lot of them are based around the analytical methods, but then trying to solve them where the analytical methods fail. So for instance, if you if you think about um, any, any function that has a, a cusp in it, that has a discontinuity as a whole in it, um, Math would just basically say, well, you can't take the derivative of that. That's against the rules. It's not allowed. Um, but physics and, and engineering basically say, well, yeah, but we can get really close to the right answer if we just ignore that part um, or deal with it in some way. All right. So we ended the other day talking about those one, three diaxial interactions. Um, and the just a reminder, I'm going to redraw this. I thought I copied one more slide than I did. Um, but those those one three diaxial interactions are the ones that show up. If you have something large like a methyl group or a bromine in position one, the other axial interactions you have them pointed in the same direction, it's sort of it's this interaction that we're talking about. 
So because they're all sort of pointed in the same general direction, they can kind of push on each other a little bit. Their electron clouds interfere with each other and you get those unfavorable steric interactions that are a lot like the torsional interactions. Right, and so the, um, if you if you remember looking at butane, we said, oh, we had those Gauss interactions where we had the two methyl groups adjacent to each other, right? And it was going to be lower energy if you put all of the largest groups opposite from each other. Well, the spacing is the same. If you put a methyl group on carbon one on the headrest of that chair, the spacing looks the same as uh, a Gauss interaction. Right, so we can see kind of where this is coming from. And the difference is, is that we're not allowed to just freely rotate this. Right, but if you do wind up putting it, um, if you do go through a chair flip though, what winds up happening is you wind up with this methyl group rotating to the axial or to the equatorial position where it's pointed away from everything else. Right? So it's not quite the same as just freely rotating this, but it's similar net effect to getting it pointed into, into the anti position. We just don't really use the terms anti and gauche when we're talking about cyclohexane because we want to make it clear that we're not just freely rotating. We have to go through those conformer flips. And there it is. There, if you go through the chair flip, you wind up with the same general shape as we had before, except now we in the equatorial position, um, we wind up with those two anti. Right, and so we can see I'm um, using the same the same equations that we did the other day with equilibrium constant. Um, we could say that they predict what the equilibrium distribution is based on the same way that we had, we can calculate numbers for those anti or those rotational barriers. We can figure out what these interactions are going to be um, energetically, and we can actually predict and then actually measure at various temperatures, what is the equilibrium concentration of these two conformers, um, which allows us to, to see some really interesting things. For one, as we might expect, the bigger the group is that's attached, the bigger those interactions are going to be. The more, and remember, those interactions are unfavorable, right? So that's going to mean the bigger, the more you're going to favor putting that big substituent into the equatorial position. Makes sense, right? It's the same idea we've been talking about for a while. We're just putting it into cyclohexane instead of just uh, Newman projections. And we can actually, we move this up here. Um, based on what the substituent is, we can just have a table of these are what the interactions look like. And that's, this is what it does to the equilibrium constant or ratio. This is the constant. Um, so if it's just, if it's a chlorine, chlorine's bigger than, than hydrogen, but not by that much. Um, and so if it's chlorine, is a two kilojoule per mole difference when you have those one three diaxial interactions compared to a hydrogen, which turns into like a 70 30 ratio. It can go back and forth relatively easy. It's still going to favor putting the chlorine in equatorial position, but not by that much. But you can see as we start getting larger and larger objects or substituents, so methyl group, ethyl group, so notice that the methyl and the ethyl are almost the same, right? Yes, it's a little bit bigger, but because it can just sort of rotate to point that second carbon just away from everything else, it doesn't really change that much for methyl or cell. And a propyl is going to be almost the same as an ethyl. It's having one carbon attached to that. If we cut, oops. <laughs> now, now, <laughs> um, if you can picture, you know, if this is the carbon that we're attaching anything, Having an ethyl group, so more of those, versus a propyl group, versus however many you want to attach there. It's on a straight chain. It doesn't matter how, car how many carbons are attached. It's still a carbon attached to cyclohexane, and then a second carbon. The third and fourth carbon aren't going to really affect those, di those diaxial interactions. <laughs> 
maybe you know a couple of tenths of a kilojoule mole because there's some slight possibility of this chain sort of rotating around and getting in the way, but not significantly, which is why it basically just stops in the head holder. Um, adding, turning it into a um, isopropyl group, on the other hand, that does affect it because now we have two carbons attached to our direct interactions. That's harder to keep it out of the way. It's not that big of a jump because you can still rotate both of those carbons kind of facing away from everything. But then if you make it a tert-butyl group, a dimethyl ethyl group, now all of a sudden there's no way you can rotate this carbon where you don't have a second methyl pointed directly towards those other diaxial spots, right? So it's a huge jump when you go from a methyl ethyl group to a dimethyl ethyl group or T-butyl group. Yeah. Is it standard practice to rotate a molecule like that to show the equation of the reaction as far as one on the left the product is in the axial position and then the one on the right is in equatorial? Is that like standard practice? To show both possibilities? Yeah, to show like with the second question that I had was with the equilibrium arrows. Mm -hmm. The other question would be is it standard practice to have one smaller if that is? If it's favoring it that strongly, it's not uncommon. I mean, really, if you draw equilibrium arrows, what you're really saying is this reaction is at equilibrium. Because what we'll see when we have multi-step reactions is it's there's whatever the rate determining step is, whatever the slowest step is in that pathway, that reaction is going to more or less be at equilibrium. And or the steps before that are going to be at equilibrium. So I just spoke wrong. Uh, incorrectly, it's the fast steps before the slow step are going to be at equilibrium, but then you, your rate determining step won't be, because as soon as you make your your product from your slow step, it goes on to the next fast steps. So that one, the slow step doesn't have a chance to reach equilibrium, but the fast steps do. And so we, what's more important is just, is it equilibrium arrow, arrow or is it a regular arrow? Because we're going to use that to distinguish between is this going slowly and allowing it to move back and forth, or is it going quickly and product is being used up as soon as it's made? Um, it's not uncommon to show it this way, but the, the main point that we're trying to make is just, is it at equilibrium or not? Um, and typically, like, we wouldn't show this step in a multi-step reaction unless, for whatever reason, if this conformer reacts, but the other one doesn't. So if whatever reason, if, if step one makes this, but then in order to get, and then step two has to start with this as the reactant, and this conformer won't work for whatever reason, it doesn't make any sense in the sense of, of these physical conformers, but there will be some cases where a rearrangement needs to happen before you can go on to step three. And so in that case, we would actually show something as simple as just a, a physical rearrangement if it needs to be rearranged before you can go to step three. Um, but you know, typically, most reactions, the physical conformer that it's sitting in is not going to affect the reaction rate. Um, so we wouldn't need to show this step per se. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's another one of those things where we, you know, we haven't even gotten to real reactions yet. We're setting the table. Any other questions on this slide? All right. So if we have a table of possible substituents, and this is you know, far from being complete. This is good enough to give you an idea. Um, really, if, if I was going to say one more thing that I would want added to this table for the sake of uh, you, you being able to use this table as a standard way to, to gauge which are the biggest interactions, the most important interactions, I would add a little meat to this table. Because off the top of my head, Bromine is going to be close to the size of the T-butyl group, 
but I don't know exactly which one is going to be larger than the other. So if we were trying to compare what's more important, getting the bromines in the axial position or getting a T-butyl group in the axial position, or sorry, equatorial, um, I, would, I would need to go look up a value to determine that for sure, because I know that they're close to that same, to the same size, sterically. Um, so when we take our break, I'm going to check our new textbook to see if they have a more complete list of the oh, diaxial interactions. There's probably somebody has done them and has made a list somewhere. All right, so when we have two substituents, we're put into one. The, the first ring we have to consider is that they could be on the same side of the opposite side, and that's what we call the stereochemistry. Um, and so, specifically, if it's a ring structure, or we'll see the same thing with pi bonds, uh, because pi bonds restrict rotation. So the, the reason that this molecule can't just freely rotate to make it the other shape, you can't just there's a difference between having both methyls on the same side of the ring versus on opposite sides of the ring is because you can't just freely rotate things around. The ring structure limits where you can rotate, right? Basically, the only rotation we can have is flipping back and forth between the two chair conformers. Um, if this isn't connected in the back, then it can rotate whichever way it wants, right? And it can rotate whichever way it wants, then it doesn't really make a difference We don't necessarily need to show which one's up and if it's the up bond or the down bond because it can freely rotate whichever way it wants. But having it stuck in that ring structure means it can't freely rotate. And so the other place that we see that is when you have pi bonds. Because if you have pi bonds, white screen, Remember, pi bonds exist above and below the sigma bond, right? And so you can't rotate a pi bond without breaking it. So if you had something like this 2-butene, you have the same sort of ice, um, stereoisomer as you do with ring structures. Because it's stuck in one position and you can't freely rotate, if it doesn't have a pi bond, then these are the same molecule, right? The fact that it has restricted rotation is what means these are two different molecules, but these aren't. All right, so we'll, and we'll get more practice with that when we get to alkenes, but it's going to be the same terminology, and it comes from the same place. That restricted ro um, rotation leads to cis-trans isomerism. And so if you've got that, that unit rotation, basically we're just going to add one extra prefix. Our nomenclature doesn't really change other than the fact we're going to add a prefix that specifies they're on the same side or they're on opposite sides. Uh, so, and again, if they're on the same side, it's cis. And if they're on opposite sides, if you have to cross the bear the ring, um, then that's going to be trans. Right, and so, and we would just indicate that this first one, naming it, if we're naming these two molecules, they're both going to start with the same parent molecule. They're both cyclohexane, right? And they're both dimethyl, one, two dimethyl. So to differentiate between the two of them, you just literally add cis or trans to the front. So the one on the left would just be cis. And I got too close to the edge. It doesn't like when I do that. Um, by convention, typically cis versus trans um, are written in italics if you're typing it up, um, but it doesn't really make a difference. Um, you know, the, 
nobody is, who's had this class is going to mix up. You know, if you say cis, they're not going to mistake it for something else because you didn't put it in italics. Um, but it is one of those one of those things that you notice when you when you've taught this class a few times, um, it starts to chill out. If we had a one two trimethyl to a third um, mm -hmm. methyl group after that, would we denote the cis or trans? So let's let's look at that one. So I'm just going to draw the ring structures being flat. So if we have one, if it's trimethyl, if it's one one two trimethyl specifically. This carbon has two of the same thing attached, right? So one of its methyls has to be trans and the other one has to be cis relative to the other methyl, right? So in this case, there is no difference between them. Right? If we had something like, uh, if it was trimethyl and they were all three on different carbons, then we have to start, we have to like have a new system basically, um, or look up how you would name that. Um, and that's uncommon enough that a, that I'm not even sure you could do something like one cis, two trans or something like that. Um, but because cis and trans is always talking about a pair of substituents, not just one substituent, it gets tricky that way. Because what are you saying is your reference point? It would probably do something like it was one, two, three to try methyl, but they'd probably call carbon one's methyl group, make that the dominant methyl group and do everything else with respect to that. Um, but again, that, that's a pretty uncommon situation. This is actually a little bit more common to have two of the same substituent on the same carbon where it actually where you actually lose the cis trans isomerism rather than having them all spread out. And actually you get pretty closely if you look at You look at uh, three D structure for glucose. Should have unfold you first. <laughs> Come on, try to think for me all the time. You don't do it this time. Glucose has a lot of cis trans isomerism going on. It's got this three, this um, six sided ring structure in the middle, right? And it has a lot of, of different isomerism happening. Um, and so this glucose specifically means not just the right formula, not just that it has all of the oxygens attached to the right carbons, but that they're facing the right way. If you swap one of these um, alcohols to the other side, it's not glucose anymore. You get some, that's one of the biggest, I think that might, if you swap the right one, you get galactose, but if you swap them a different way, you're going to wind up with some of the um, sugar alcohols that they use as artificial sweeteners. Um, stuff like that um, starts happening. Um, and actually, to go back to your question about trimethyl, what we would do is we would actually start to differentiate. We use a different type of stereochemistry that allows us to specify each carbon individually rather than a pair of substituents relative to each other. Once I looked at glucose, I realized I realized that that's what we would do in that case. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah. <laughs> so if we have two possible isomers or stereoisomers. The cis and the trans for this case. How do we know which one's more stable? The trans has less um, uh, interactions than the steric. One of them is going to have less interactions 
want less one three diaxial interaction. So basically, we need to draw both of them in their chair conformers and see one of them is going to have um, less fewer interactions and one of them is not. And if you remember, I didn't make a big deal of it at the time because we were talking about other um, things, but the direction of the axial um, position when we drew our chair conformer, it alternated, right? It's up at the headrest and then it's down for the next two carbons and it's up for the other two headrest or uh, armrest carbons and then it's down for the last carbon. So basically when you have them like this, we can, we're going to be able to figure out are they going to be axial or equatorial and are, what do those interactions look like um, in, a, in a pretty straightforward way. And you, you start to be able to see what that's going to do, which one's going to um, pretty quickly once you can make that connection. Just, we're going to go through and draw this so I make a point. But the fact that these two are on opposite sides in our axial positions alternating which means our equatorial positions also alternate, right? One up, one down. This one, we're gonna be able to put them both in an equatorial position at the same time in one of our chair conformers. And in this one, we're gonna be stuck in a situation where one of them can be equatorial, the other, but if one's equatorial, the other one has to be axial. And so let's try that. Try drawing them. Start by just getting a good base molecule, get your cyclohexane drawn and chair conformer properly, and then add um, your substituents 
All right, so when we're drawing these out, we can define carbon one and carbon two to be whatever's convenient. And I was toying with the idea of putting them on the two carbons that are facing towards us, or that are the, the armrest that's closest to us, just for the sake, because that actually makes it really easy to see whether you have this, whether you're drawing the cis versus the trans isomer. But it makes it a little bit harder to see what happens when we go through the chair conformer. So I'm going to show it both ways. So if we're drawing, if we start by drawing, and I try to be consistent with the color coding here, if we say that the red lines are the methyls. This top one is the trans isomer, and this bottom one is the cis isomer. And so, and again, because the axial interactions are always in the plane of the board, um, they tend to be easier to see and draw where the axial position is. And so when you have two adjacent carbons, the trans position are both going to be axial in this case, right? Because you have one up that's away from everything else because your equatorial position is pointed the same general direction as the bond going away from us, which means it's going to be pointed out towards us. And on this side, same thing, except our axial position goes down and our bond coming out towards us is in the equatorial position. So like I, like I mentioned before, I usually find it easier to draw your axial position first, and then that's going to make it a lot more obvious where your equatorial position has to go. Because remember, your equatorial or um, your fourth bond that you're drawing always has to go away from everything else, right? So drawing the axial makes it really clear where, where are your two bonds that are in the plane of the board. So if we have dimethyl, if we have trans one, two dimethyl, cyclohexane, and our red bonds are our methyl group. So one above the ring, one below the ring. If we picture flattening this out so that our, instead of being a chair, so that it's a flat hexagon, if that flat hexagon would be in the board and out of the board, right? So up and down relative to that flat hexagon, it's going to be our trans isomer. When it goes through a chair flip, and here's where it's harder to see why the, the armrest carbons are maybe not the best choice, um, is it's easy to see when you do the chair flip with the headrests and the footrests, it's easy to see how they switch from axial to equatorial, right? These ones are a little bit more difficult to picture, but if you think of my thumb being the blue position and my pointer the red position, when you go when you flip the footrest up, these are going to go like that, right? Because flipping the, the headrest up means that you're now pushing those ones away, right? And so you wind up going from here to here, which is why. You go from they also swap axial and equatorial positions, even though it's not as obvious as the headrest and the footrest. The easy rule of thumb to remember is just everything when you go through a chair flip, everything swaps axial and equatorial. If it was axial, now it's equatorial. If it was equatorial, now it's axial. And so we had both of them in axial positions. So we go through chair flip. All of a sudden, both of our red carbons are, are in the equatorial position. So just between these two conformers, we can say this one's going to be way more stable, right? We're avoiding all of those one, three diaxial interactions by doing that. Here, if we have the, the cis conformer, and again, it gets a little bit harder to see how this is the cis conformer, but if you have one, if this red carbon is sticking straight up, well, the blue position is sticking straight down, so this one must be the other one. If we flatten this out, this would be above the ring structure, even though it's not immediately obvious because it's equatorial. When it's drawn in 3D, it's hard to see that, but if you picture flattening this molecule out, 
you're going to wind up with the blue being my thumb, my pointer being the red one. So red would be above the ring structure if we did that, right? So this is our cis polymer. And when we go through that chair flip, or in, initially we wind up with one axial and one equatorial, right? So one favorable, one, or one favorable, one unfavorable. And when we go through the chair flip, okay, great, we get one equatorial, but now we're, the other one's axial, right? We're stuck. One of them has to be axial, no matter which state we're in. I didn't draw. Yeah, oh, you're right. I bumped it with the eraser. Yeah. We're talking about the flat thing, but yeah. <laughs> right, so yeah, so the, the fact that we can get both of them to be favorable versus we're stuck in the cis conformer here with one of them favorable, one unfavorable means that these two are going to be identical in terms of energy, right? No matter what, we've got a methyl group in the axial and a methyl group in equatorial. So same interactions, no matter which conformer we're in. So not only could we not tell the difference between these two, really, they're identical energetically. Versus here, we are actually going to have two different energies so this would be the least favorable conformer. This would be the most favorable conformer. This one's more favorable than either of these as well, right? Because our options are two smiley faces, two frowny faces. One smiley, one frowny, one smiley, one frowny. Smiley meaning more stable, right? And so energetically, this is the most stable isomer and it's the most stable conformer of this isomer. I began drawing this with the methyl group on the headrest. Yeah. And then the other one on either side. It doesn't really matter, I guess. It does not. And um, that's thanks for reminding me. I wanted to draw to look at it both ways here because by convention, that's that's more common, frankly, is to put carbon one as the headrest or the foot rest. Yeah. Um it just it's it is it's harder to see the cis versus the trans part of it though. So if we say that, try and use the same coloration, it's easy to see how the red one goes from axial to equatorial. Then the question is just, okay, the red on this carbon, let's see, we had this, this one was the, was the cis, right? So if our two options are either axial facing the exact opposite direction or equatorial, the equatorial one has to be the cis position relative to the red. Which you can you can kind of see once you have them drawn out, especially if you drew it with a wedge. How if they were if you flattened that out, how both of the reds would be pointed above the plane of the ring, but it's not quite as obvious. Um, so I actually made use of just understanding that, okay, using the process of elimination, if the two axial positions are that opposite from each other, they're definitely in the transposition relative to each other, right? So the equatorial one must be cis, because it's really clear that the red and the blue are opposite, are trans. And then when we go through the chair flip, the blue then on the carbon that's facing most towards us is now going to be equatorial. And the red one is axial. And right, so maybe that one actually might even be a little bit easier to see how they're the same side, the two red ones. I, yeah, I started doing the trans one, and then I saw what you were doing. I thought it was pretty easy. You backed up. No, it, it's one of those cases where you kind of want to look. If you have four options and you want to pick, figure out if they're all the same, or, you know, yeah, it's more writing, which it takes more space on your notebook, but it might be worth it to draw all four possibilities so you can see them rather than trying until you get really good at this. 
um, it's really easy to confuse yourself, right? Yeah. Um, really easy. <laughs> so on this one, do the same thing. The red being up on carpet one on the headrest. And then, but now we're going to put the red down on that side. Which means here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the blue are definitely opposite of each other here. And so the trans isomer, the one, two trans isomer is going to be more stable. And I did not need to do that. I just forgot which one I had written in which order. Before, this was the trans and this was the cis. I accidentally switched them when I redrew everything. So, again, easy to see that this is trans when you got one pointed up and the other one was one, one E over here. That's obvious to see it's the trans, even though the blue is a little bit harder to see whether that's the cis or the trans. So use the process of elimination, use the easy positions to define, and then say, therefore, my last one must be, yeah, you know, the other spot. So easier to see how you get the, the chair flip works in this case, but harder to see the, the cis versus trans. That's why it's worth drawing in both ways um, for, for the sake of me demonstrating to everybody here. I wouldn't expect you to redraw eight different cyclohexane structures to answer this question, especially not once you get the hang of this. All right, so questions so far. Again, one of those things where if I'm going through it and doing it on the boards, not that tricky. When you get the blank sheet of paper, it's hard, right? Makes it just hard to see the three dimensions. Yeah, that takes a lot of practice. Um, and so this case, this has um, chlorine versus methyl, instead of being dimethyl, but it's the same, the same um, options, right? It's still one, two. We don't get anything other than the four possibilities I just drew until we start swapping out instead of making it one, two, if it's one, three, I substitute it, it's gonna be different, right? Um, so this is just, more neatly drawn for the same same thing. If they're trans, the methyl and the chlorine, and they're on carbon one and carbon two relative to each other, they can either both be axial or both be equatorial. And just to reinforce out of those two that are drawn, which is the more stable complement? The one on the right, because they're both equatorial, right? According to the axial position, right? Sorry, they're both axial on the left, and they're both equatorial on the right. So this one is the more stable, not just because the chlorine's equatorial, but because the methyl is also equatorial. If we get a situation like we had on the last one where you have two where you, one's locked into axial, one's axial, the other's equatorial, or vice versa. If they're not the same, then we go back to that table. This says which one has the most unfavorable interactions. And we say, okay, well, the chlorine is smaller than the methyl group. So if we have to choose one of them to be axial, we'll put the chlorine axial. Oh, for any, yeah. Which is several so organic chemists <laughs> get lazy with this because um, a lot of times, rather than CH3 is not that hard to write out, um, but for whatever reason, they still tend to do this. I, see, I understand it more um, when they, they use ET as shorthand for an ethyl group because writing CH2, CH3, it starts to take up more space. Um, but yeah, ME and ET are very commonly used as 
they look like they're elemental abbreviations, but they're saying ethyl group, methyl group. You don't really see it for propyl or butyl, but if you did, it would just be PR and EU. The thing is, once you get bigger, it's an ethyl group, there's still only two carbons to attach something to, right? So you can write ETOH, and it doesn't matter which carbon you put it on. If you said PROH, there's two different carbons you could put an OH on, right? And so you would need to specify, is it isopropyl alcohol or is it n-propyl alcohol or one propanol versus two propanol would be the better name. But either way, just so you've seen that. So as far as them being, this is the trans, right? This is, or so, so if you're ever unsure, if you have it drawn this flat skeletal structure, you can go back to this, that's easy to see, right? Yeah, but yeah, if, the, if you have them, you look at these two, Pointed straight up, pointed straight down relative to the rest of the ring. So if this one cis, would it be more stable to have the methyl group in the equatorial based on that? That's a perfect, perfect one to look at. So I'll set it up the same way, actually. Let me see. Black, I'm trying to color code everything again. So our two possible chair compromers. So we call this carbon one, let's put the methyl of carbon one. So at the headrest. So if the methyl is up, Or are you also is supposed to be up. And then once it goes to the chair flip, you get the metal is now equatorial and the chlorine is axial. Right, there's still still cis. So in this case, we're in that case where we're locked into one of them has to be undib, one of them has to be axial, no matter what. So we would just go to that table and see which one is bigger. Those kilojoule per mole interactions. The bigger that interaction is, we can just say sterically, physically, that's all. It's it's a bigger kilojoule interaction because it's physically a larger substituent. So a lot of times I'll just say spatially, it's bigger. That means the same thing as energetically, it's bigger when it comes to the sterics. So methyl had larger interactions. Chlorine was only two kilojoules per mole and methyl was like seven, right? So that tells us that the methyl 1,3 diaxial interactions are more important. So if we're trying to minimize those interactions, we have to put the methyl in the equatorial spot. And the chlorine is stuck in the um, in the axial spot, and we can actually look at those relative ratios, those numbers, and plug it into our k equals e to the negative delta g over over rt, and the difference in the, those two interactions, seven kilojoules versus two kilojoules, that five kilojoule per mole difference is what we would actually we could actually plug in there to get to estimate what the ratio would be. We're going to see equilibrium between these two, but how much does the equilibrium favor? We know it's going to favor this one, but if we want to know by how much, we can just take those numbers. Our differences in the energies are what we would plug into e to the minus five over RT, 5,000, five times 10 to the three. To the diligence, right? We can get ourselves an answer there to figure out what that ratio is going to be. Um, I did promise, though, that this class was going to have that much math. <laughs>
So typically what you'll see in a lot of OCHEM textbooks is they'll just do this for you. Like, like they'll, we'll talk about it in terms of energies and do like you know, relative, what are the energies, but then they'll also just have a column for, and that means K is this, um, but it's always just coming back to this equation, right? And the only thing tricky about this equation is you gotta remember for kilojoules into joules. And it does change with temperature. At different temperatures, your equilibrium constant is going to change. Basically, at lower temperatures, when T gets really small, this term gets really big, right? This whole exponential gets really big, and you see a bigger difference in between the equilibrium concentrations um, when you get to the low temperatures. All right. The next thing we're going to look at is we start. So here's more about cis versus trans. We talked about those. The next thing we're going to start talking about is um, is the other type of stereoisomers, which are called chiral stereoisomers. Um, so we'll take a break. Let's come back to five after. We'll talk about this briefly. One new skill. Um, it's actually a little bit more abstract, but at the same time, it's easier to actually answer the questions um, for this one than it is for the, at least it was for me when I was learning it. Um, so, and then we'll get into Excel stuff. So let's come back to five after.
All right, let's do one more new topic, new concept, and then we'll switch over to Excel. So this is just a, I don't always see the point in flowcharts when they're as simple as there's only one decision, um, but this would be part of a larger flowchart between, you know, um, isomers versus totally different molecules, right? That are still hydrocarbons. So you could have hydrocarbons, and then within hydrocarbons, they could be isomers or not isomers. And then within isomers, they can be constitutional isomers or stereoisomers. Um, and so here's just the same example I used earlier for cis 2 butene versus trans 2 butene. Um, it gets a it's a little bit different when, when we're dealing with the ring structure, the plane of the ring defines the cis versus the trans, right? And they're either both on the same side of that plane or they're both on opposite sides. It's a little bit trickier um, for, for some people to visualize how that applies to um, to butene, for instance, for these alkenes. Um, but basically, you can think of the pi bond as defining a plane. And they're either on the same side of that plane or on opposite sides of that plane. Um, the other way that I that I define it is if you can for these ones, if you can draw a circle around both substituents without touching the pi bond and without making it some crazy weird shape, then it must be cis. If you try and draw a circle around the two substituents and it includes the pi bond, then it's trans. They're on opposite sides of the pi bond, so to draw a circle around both of them means you also have to draw around the pi bond. Um, it's, it's one of those things that I, I never thought about. It's interesting as when, as a student, I remember that there were things that I struggled with and there were things that just, I never even considered it in different ways. That's really obvious if it comes out that way. Um, Cis versus transfer alkenes was one of those for me, where I'd like, oh, obviously it's on the same side versus opposite side. Um, that doesn't, you know, what do you mean? It's hard to understand. Um, but when I started teaching it, you start seeing how other people wrap their heads around things. This is something that people sometimes struggle with. So I just wanted to try and, and uh, make that crystal clear as much as I can. And again, we'll see more practice with this when we get to alkenes or chapter on alkenes. Um, the one thing that I will say um, is that some people do this and want to specify whether this is cis or trans because they're on the same side of the pi bond, right? But it's not, they're not attached across the pi bond which means there's no hindered rotation. There's hindered rotation over here between this carbon's gonna have two hydrogens attached to it, right? But anytime you get the same two objects on one side of the hindered rotation, it doesn't really matter if this hydrogen is up and that hydrogen's down because they're both hydrogen. It's identical. If you, if you call this cis and then you switch these two, it's gonna be the exact same molecule, right? So we're talking about across the pipe is where you get that cis trans isomer. And whether it's hydrogens or not, if I turn one of these into a methyl, now these two aren't the same, right? But these two are. So same thing. Anytime you have two identical substituents on the same thing, and this is exactly goes back to your question about the rings too, right? When you put the two methyls on the same carbon, then all of a sudden it didn't matter which way they were drawn because if you flipped them, it's the same thing. They're identical. Does that make sense? It creates like two identical reference points. Too. Exactly. Right. If we, you know, if, you, if we got really clever with this, one of the ways that they, they do stuff like, like determining um, biochemical pathways in cells, you want to know what carbon from, from this goes into what carbon from that pathway, you introduce a molecule that has one of the carbons labeled, by which I mean you put a radioactive isotope in instead of it just being carbon 12. If you do that, if you put carbon 14 in for one of these, 
Now all of a sudden you can tell the difference again, right? But you need some way of telling the difference. If they're identical atoms, you can't tell the difference between them. The isotopic labeling is really a clever way around that because chemically they're the same um, as far as charges go, as far as valence shells and everything. But you can detect the difference if you then analyze it from a from a molecular mass point of view. That's a um, you can. Yeah, you know, that's that's one of several tools that they use that they you know feed radioactive glucose glucose with a bunch of either a bunch of deuterium for hydrogen um, or with a bunch of carbon thirteen instead of carbon twelve um, to a cell and then you see what molecules the, the cell makes that also have carbon thirteen in them and you can use that to say okay well it must be taking glucose and going through these processes because you get acetyl CoA that with carbon thirteen in it. Therefore, the glucose, the cells turning glucose into acetyl CoA somehow. That's one of the pathways. Mm -hmm. right, so, and basically, um, that how all of those cell, those pathways that you learn in biology, like the Krebs cycle and, and glycolysis and fatty acid oxidation, all of those pathways were determined with just a whole bunch of time and effort, just brute force. They just had, you know, you got. 100,000 diff different chemical pathways in the yeast cell, and I might be underselling it there. <laughs> um, and you just have, okay, this grad student's work for the next five years is going to be figuring out this reaction, and you, isotopic labeling is one of the tools that they would use. And when you put it all together, you get a cohesive view of what the cell does and what the pathways look like. All right, so this is just another view, remember, um, to demonstrate that the pi bond is a hindered rotation, but we already talked about that, so I'm just gonna skip to the next one. The other way you can have a stereoisomer, other than a hindered rotation, is if you get, anytime you get a carbon or an atom specifically that has four different substituents, anytime you can look at an atom and say, it's got four different things attached to it. It is what, and I believe this is the mathematical term, um, it's a chiral center. Um, you also see the term an asymmetric carbon or an asymmetric atom. So, and it, it's it's specific to when you have you have to have four different unique things you can tell the difference between them. Just like we were talking about before, with um, if you have two things that you can't tell the difference between, then this doesn't apply. But the second you get four different substituents, the nature of the universe we live in is that it has three spatial dimensions, the way we perceive it at least. Um, and that means that if you have any three points defines a plane, right? If you have any three points that define a plane, so let's say A, B, and C are defining a plane, and you've got a carbon in the middle. D, the, the fourth point, has to either be above the plane or below the plane. If it's a tetrahedral carbon or tetrahedral shape. So the fact that you can have above the plane or below the plane creates this non-superimposable mirror image, which the easiest one to understand is it's like your, your hands. They're identical, right? Assuming you don't have lots of scars on your hands like I do, I'm working with hot glassware over the years. Um, but you, there's nothing that you can do that's going to make it so that your left hand can fit into the same space as your right hand. You think about it in terms of gloves, in terms of like putting, you know, getting your your palm print on to get into a door. We had like biometric screening at a um, at a job site or something like that. Um, you can't just take your left hand and put it in there, right? Thumbs in the wrong spot but all the fingers in the wrong spot, really, right? You can flip your hand over and almost get that to work, but now it's not your palm. Now it's backwards. 
Now, we try to wear your glove, your right glove on your left hand with your fingers all reversed. The fingers bend the wrong way, right? In theory, that could kind of work for gloves, but um, the point is, is that it's not the same. Your right hand is physically different from your left hand, even though it has all the same pieces all connected the same way. Right, and four different substituents. With four different <laughs> substituents, right. Um, but basically, anytime you've got an object that's going to have a left, a right, a front, a back, and that creates a top and a bottom, right? That means that it's if you can tell the difference between it, if the top is different than the bottom, and the left is different from the right, and the front is different from the back, it's a chiral object. Right? Because you have to define it in three dimensions, which means you can't just arbitrarily switch those. If you had a Let's say you had a car where the top and the bottom were identical. It's a mirror image of the, of the top and the bottom. Make the seats a little bit tricky, but let's pretend you could do that. It's an RC car. <laughs> uh, in theory, that's no longer a chiral object because you can flip it over and get the same thing. It's the same object. But as soon as you have all three dimensions defined, which requires at least four unique objects attached, then you're going to wind up with a chiral object. So would the chair be non-chiral? Yeah. Well, would it? The mirror image looks the same, right? Yeah. So the chair is non-chiral. It's achiral. Until if you took a chair and you built a desk into the right side, now it's kind of because it's going to be a right-handed desk or a left-handed desk. Right? But the fact that two of its sides are identical, left and right are identical, the way it's drawn first, means it's a kind And if you take the mirror image, you get the same thing back. The other, the other way you can test it is um, a chiral objects, objects that are not chiral, tend to have an internal mirror plane. There's some way you can put a mirror in there where you can't tell the difference. It's the exact same object, right? The internal mirror plane for this chair would be right down the middle, up and down, right? You wouldn't be able to tell the difference whether that mirror was there or not. It's identical. It's really like a line symmetry. A line of symmetry, yeah. We call it a plane of symmetry specifically when we're dealing in three dimensions because a line of symmetry, it's really easy to find a line of symmetry two um, in two dimensions um, in a three-dimensional object. Would it be chiral if you rotated the chair 90 degrees and left the mirror where it is? Yeah. It would not be, it would be asymmetric in that dimension, but the object itself is still a chiral. Because, so think of X, Y, and Z, it's got a, it's, um, if you call them, the way the mirror is drawn here, let's call that the Z axis. And left to right is the Y axis, and front to back is the X axis. It's got a, a mirror plane in the Z axis, uh, axis, no matter which way you rotate the chair. Gotcha. All right, and if you could picture, if we were, you know, evolutionary things that happened differently, and we wound up with an internal mirror plane in your hand, so that you had two thumbs and two pointer fingers, then your hand is still kind of would be chiral if it's if you're talking about it attached to your body because it's either attached on this side or it's attached on this side. But your hand itself, just the hand, would be a chiral if you had an internal mirror plane. Your hand would look more like like a pincher. Than, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <but> um, <laughs> so and that's actually, they actually use that internal line of symmetry. We have an internal line of symmetry. It goes right down the middle of us, right? Um, Is that right with our organs? Not quite, yeah. 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 <laughs> Developmentally, yes. So because we developed from cells that split and they split evenly across that until differentiation starts happening in the organs. Gotcha. Um, 
This is but it's, it, it has to do with they, the, I can't think what the term is in A and P for a bilateral symmetry, I think. Bilateral symmetry is, is organisms that have that internal mirror plane, at least developmentally. Um, they have that at some point. Not every organism does, but most animals do. Trees don't, though, right? Uh, some trees do. It's not every tree. Some trees grow branches symmetrically, right? And some don't. Yeah. But anyway, um, the 3D shape of the molecules winds up being really important, especially in biochemistry, because everything about biochemistry is all catalyzed enzymatic re um, reactions, right? And those enzymes have active sites that molecules have to fit into, like your hand fitting into a glove. And the mirror image doesn't usually fit in the same way. If it's got a chiral center, the mirror image is going to interact differently with your enzymes because it won't fit into the same the same active sites. Right? So um, the other example, the example that gets used in all the time in biochemistry is a key. A key fitting into a lock is a really common way of understanding how enzymes work. The substrate, the reactant is the key, and it has to fit into the active site, which is the lock. If you take a mirror image of your key, it doesn't usually work. Right, simple keys, yes, but not complex keys that not chiral keys that have that four distinct sides. All right, so and that that's the same thing that happens with these. For instance, these two molecules really, really similar a molecule called called carbone. Um, this carbon right here is a chiral center. And if you look closely, that's the only chiral center. Every other carbon is either sp2, which means it's flat. And if it's flat, it's got that internal mirror plane, right? Um, or it's attached to two of the same object, like these two carbons. This, yeah, this direction around the ring is different than this direction around the ring, but it's also got two identical hydrogens attached to it. So the fact that it's got two identical hydrogens means it's not chiral. So this one carbon center, one chiral carbon, creates a huge difference in the way that it fits into our, our smell receptors. Spearmint versus caraway. Kind of a big difference. Don't think of those two scents as being related at all, right? Because it fits into totally different receptors in your brain or in your, your nose, which sends different signals in your brain. Um, and it's just based on that one stereo center. Um, we did a lab when I took OCHEM in college where we made this molecule. Um, the way we made it, we made equal amounts of both of these at the same time. And the whole floor in the chemistry building smelled like, like these two compounds for about a week. Um, and to this day, I still have a hard time differentiating between the two because they're so ingrained together in my mind from that experience. I can tell the difference between them, but I associate both of them with that memory. And so I wind up with them not being able to tell the difference sometimes uh, if I'm not paying attention, which is kind of weird. Um, also related, there's like one in 20 or one in 50 chance genetically that that your smell receptors perceive both of them the same way. It's unusual. It's not standard. Um, but if you have your smell receptors, um, if their active sites are similar enough in shape, there's a mutation that you can have that allows them to accept both of these molecules identically. And those people literally can't tell the difference between these two flavors, which is kind of cool. Is that like similar way some people can't stand um party mantra. Mantra, yeah. yeah yeah it's the same it's similar mutation where it's, it's a genetic mutation that affects the binding sites in that case um it triggers a soapy taste in those people it hits the same receptor site as soap would um and other people have a more um their their soap taste receptors are more selective and so it doesn't fit into the same active site that triggers the soap response. So there's soap 
the mutation in their receptors yeah. for the soap. Where the soap yeah. gets a gets a positive from cilantro or from soap. And most people have just soap or cilantro, not both. Yeah. Um, so these two the the stereoisomers that we get from an asymmetric center, we call them enantiomers. Um, which I believe comes from either the Greek or Latin for mirror. Um, I don't know that specifically, but overs, we're familiar with that, right? Um, so in this case, enantiomer specifically means mirror images of each other that aren't the same object. So that's just an example of how you have different, different um, three-dimensional shape so most of our amino acids are chiral because the carbon that has the R group attached to them has a hydrogen, has an amine, has an acid group, and then it has the R group. Other than glycine, where the R group is a hydrogen, and then you have two that are identical. Other than glycine, every one of our amino acids in our body is chiral. You can only use one version of them. Basically, and it's sort of determined arbitrarily, um, the same way that that being not being right-handed versus left-handed, but um, the same way that which side of the car you sit on when you drive is arbitrary. It just it was decided in America um, evolutionarily when cells first before cells probably um, there was likely an equal mixture of both stereoisomers, a lot of the amino acids that were around at the time. And whatever, for whatever reason, the RNA that, that was able to self-replicate first um, got associated with one version, but not the other. And so we basically only use one stereoisomer of all of the different amino acids. Um, but life could conceivably have very easily developed in a way that we use the left-handed instead of the right-handed stereoisomer. Um, which is kind of interesting to think about. Thought we did right hand drive because if it's right hand, the stick shifts right. Except if you look at the oldest cars, actually driving on the right in America predates cars, horses, and carriages. Um, and so it depends. There's there's a lot of theories I've heard, and I don't know which one is most correct historically. I've heard that in the in the U.S., um, it was so we drive on the right so that. Um, so that the when you're if you're using a switch with your horse, it's further away from the other cart, so you're less likely to hit the other person's um, horse. Yeah. Um, but I've, and I've also heard that that you know in England in feudal societies they typically drive on the left so that your right hand was free to either they salute or wave or wield a weapon. Um, so and I've heard that from Japan and England both and France. That because they they established that norm when knights were still a thing, um, versus America was post feudal um, by the time we, we were established. But I don't know how much truth that is that or doesn't really much. So we'll move on. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So the way we we need to name these if we if we wind up with two molecules that are different, non superimposable. That means we have two different isomers, right? And our nomenclature system needs to be updated. Same way we had to add cis and trans when we had hindered rotation. For chiral centers, we have to use, um, we use basically use right-handed versus left-handed. Um, and so the, the, the simplest skill to that we get out of this is basically find all the asymmetric centers. All all of the atoms that have four different things attached to them. So basically anything where you've got a pi bond is out because it's going to be planar, right? Or any delocalized electrons is going to make it planar. So you can kind of get rid of anything like that and anything. So not that, not that. That's not necessarily delocalized, but they not either of these and anything you can point to it and say it has two hydrogens attached, two or more hydrogens on it, then that's not going to be an asymmetric center or two or more, any of the same substituent, 
So looking for methyls, for instance. This nitrogen has methyl group. It has the rest of the molecule this way. That's two different things. It has a lone pair, which is a third thing taking up space. So that's three different substituents, but then it's got an identical methyl. If this methyl was hydrogen, this would be an asymmetric center. So you'd have hydrogen, lone pair, methyl group, rest of the molecule, four different things. That if they're both methyls, means it's not an asymmetric center. That carbon, two hydrogens. Methyl, any, any carbon at the end of the carbon chain is going to be CH3, right? Or at least have two, you know, even if you had something else attached to it, it's probably got two hydrogens. So out of the ones that are left, the oxygen in a symmetric center? Two lone pairs. Two lone pairs are identical. So for these two, for this one, we've got methyl group, the direction towards the nitrogen, the direction towards everything else, and a hydrogen that's not pictured, right? So that one's asymmetric. So for skeletal structures, especially for carbons, you only need to see three of them because then there's going to be a fourth that's hydrogen. Just remember, remember you've got to count four um, for all the things that are attached. Here we have four lines drawn from carbon. So as long as all four of them are different, this one's asymmetric as well. So we have the oxygen, we have directly into a benzene ring, we have a carbon and then a benzene ring, slightly different. And then we have this mess towards the nitrogen that's going to be different. So this one also will be an asymmetric center. So even though it's attached to two carbons, what the, because the carbons have different groups on them? That different because we can tell the difference between, is it the carbon that's part of the benzene ring or is it a carbon that's not part of the benzene ring? Those are different from each other. Even though the, the nuclei are the same, um, the rest of the molecule is different. So would a pi bond to that, um, Last carbon that you X out, the mm -hmm. pi bond to that make it similar or make it? You're talking about this carbon? Uh, sorry, the second last one, the one on the benzene ring. Yeah, that one there. This one. Yeah, if that had a pi bond on it, there will be two pi bonds inside of the benzene ring. So, so that just for, yeah. Um, if, if it was, if this was part of a benzene ring, then it's the same as that one. Yeah, same. But if it's part of just some other larger, let's just say that the rest of that benzene ring is not there. It's just two conjugated pi bonds. Yeah. They're both conjugated pi bonds. They're similar to each other, but that's the benzene ring and that's not in a ring structure. So you can still tell the difference. All right. I think that's where we're going to end today. We won't go into the actual naming and determining R and S. Um, right-handed and left-handed for today so that we have a few minutes. I've only left us like 15 minutes to do Excel stuff. But I think that that should be enough to get you started on that. Um, and then, so the quiz this week is going to be some cyclohexane, share polymer, ring flips, pick the most stable one, like we've been practicing. And I think that there's a question like this on there, find all the asymmetric centers. Um, and I'll make sure that there's no R versus S because that's that's going to be the next step is how we determine is it right-handed or left-handed. Um, so we'll go from there. So I'm going to go, I'm going to pull up the, go ahead. Never moved the keyboard short that is for so let us switch between tabs. I think control shift over. Anyway. Um, all right, so here's the data. I pulled it out as a CSV to get rid of any, any formulas um, that are in there. So it's just the raw numbers. So when you open it up in any spreadsheet form, any spreadsheet program should be able to open a CSV without any issues. Um, you might have to download it to your desktop and then click open if you're using Sheets, but that should work. 
Um, the, the big difference when it comes to making charts in online Excel and sheets compared to regular Excel is regular Excel will let you um, pick and choose whatever you want for your X's and Y's when you put in a scatter plot. Versus, but in sheets, I think Sheets has fixed this a little bit, but still still has some hiccups. And definitely for the online version of Excel, when you do a scatter plot, your X's and your Y's have to be right next to each other. You can't, they can't have any columns in between them. Um, and so when you have everything on the same sheet like this, the workaround that I've found works the best is to just copy and paste them into a new sheet. Rather than if I was setting this up as um, here, so, and just to recap for those of you who haven't had GenCam in a bit or haven't worked with Excel as much, um, when we want to put in a chart in the sciences, we're always going to do scatter plots. Um, basically, only one of these buttons matters to us, and that's the one where you have X, Y. Um, and so, I think most of them is usually called a scatter plot or an X, Y plot. Sheets might call it something a little different. Um, don't be fooled by a line chart. Line charts don't let us specify the X value. They assume every X value is the same distance from the one before it and it has a difference of one. So anytime we're using scientific data, we want to specify X's and Y's. So we're always going to go to X to do scatter charts. When you click on the scatter, it gives you some different options. Again, might look a little bit different versus online versus the Google Sheets. Um, yeah, I just a reminder. If you have the, the cursor, when I say cursor in Excel, I mean the um, the selected cell, the uh, highlighted box. Also, I should, should since this tripped up the uh, high schoolers, when I say Excel, I mean any spreadsheet program, which is by, because of the way that I was educated, um, the only spreadsheet program that mattered was Excel, so everything was Excel, like the same band-aid. So you said computers. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so when I say Excel, I mean sheets as well, but they both have this issue. If the selected cell um, has data in it or is adjacent to data, then when you go to insert your chart, it tries to think for you. And sometimes it gets it right, but more often it gets it wrong. Um, and so what you want to do instead is click, put your selected cell away from everything else, at least one column away from everything. If, if you even have it here, it'll try to think for you. And don't let it. Get it away from everything. And then when you hit insert, and for this one, since we have so many data points, we don't really want that type of scatter plot. We prefer one that where the individual data points are not labeled. Um, and that's going to generally be true when you have a very large data set, you don't want to see the individual data points. You want to see the lines. And then, so when you do that, if you get your, your cursor away from everything else, you get a blank box. And so then to, to if you're on a Mac, it might look a little bit different too. Um, sometimes it'll actually open up some of these, um, some of the menus on the side, on the right-hand side of the menu, will, the format menu will show up sometimes. It's all the same options. It just looks a little different. Um, So, but what you're looking for now is select data or data range. And select data will bring up this dialog box to allow you to add a data series to your plot. Right now it's all empty. When we get add, and on a, on a Mac, it looks like just like a little plus symbol. There's like an empty box on the left-hand side. There's a little plus symbol at the bottom. Um, you can select a series name, but you don't have to. Um, anytime you want to just click to tell it what to do, um, you just hit this little button. It'll look something like this, or they'll have um, an option for you to, to do that. When you do that, it kind of minimizes it, and you say, okay, for the title, let's say I'm going to do the, the simple tails. is going to be my first plot. When you hit enter, it brings you back to this. Well, it doesn't usually do that, but it doesn't really matter, because all that really matters is this section right here. And then it asks you, if you don't see series X and series Y, if you don't have a way to select X's and your Y's, then you probably click line chart instead of a, a scatter plot. Because we want to tell it what the X's are. So you're going to select these and then keep, when you're dealing with large data sets, keyboard shortcuts. You don't want to have to click and drag all the way down for 2000 points, right? 
Um, but if you're using if you have a keyboard shortcut, get to the top of the data range. And then I think this applies to sheets as well. Control and an arrow key jumps you to the end of the data set in whatever direction you push. So up and control up and control down. If you hold shift as well, shift in an arrow key lets you select like this. So control shift down selects the whole data set. May save a ton of time. <laughs> Keyboard shortcuts in Excel, especially with big data sets, are a big deal. Uh, and then it leaves us down here at the bottom, but that doesn't really matter because the next thing is series Y values. And we can select them from top down or bottom up because what matters is that it's going to show up the, the highest data point in each of those columns. It's going to be paired together. All right. So now when we hit enter and whoa. It really, I'm just gonna try to enter again. I hope that works. <laughs> um, I've never seen it do that before. That was weird. And we get our chart. Looks fairly pretty, right? Nice, clean data. It's big data sets are wonderful for having nice, clean curves. Um, if you're doing this in the online version, you just have to make sure that you have an X right next to your Y for each of them. And one of the ways you can do that, if you have all your data all squished together, um, and or you only have your X's written out once. Sometimes you'll see a bunch of columns of Y values and your, your X value is just by itself over here. The workaround I found for our sheets and for the online Excel is add a new sheet. Add a new sheet, it's still in the same file, but it just gives you a blank spreadsheet. And so you can basically say, okay, I'm gonna take this, these two columns, and I'm gonna put them into the other sheet all by themselves. So you can kind of pick and choose what, what columns to put and you can rearrange them, leave your raw data alone so you're not manipulating anything that's gonna affect any other charts. Just basically add a new sheet for every chart that you wanna do. If you do that, then you can make it look however of Sheets or, or Excel or whatever program you're using, whatever format you need it to be in. Right. And then the other tool that I'm going to show you is that sometimes if you if you copy and paste the formula, it copies the formula with it and changes the references, right? So like remember how we had to set up our our um, x values because everything was all all weird. So I'm going to just delete these as a CSV file. It doesn't copy any formulas; it just copied the values. But let's say you were working from one, like we did before, we said zero plus 0.25 over 60, right? And then we just copy and pasted that formula. Again, keyboard shortcuts to move around, very helpful. Um, control C and Control D are your copy and paste shortcuts as well. So you train that left pinky to just sit on your control key um, and you can start getting pretty fast. Um, if we copy and paste this over, though, it's going to copy the formula as well. We might not want that. Anytime you want to, you have a formula, but then you want the raw numbers instead. Um, Excel has a, a value, just, instead of just hitting paste or just using control D, if you right click, it gives you paste options now. This is just going to be your regular default. One of the options is just paste the values. And that basically strips the formula away. Formulas are all gone. The numbers were carried over instead. So anytime you're copying and pasting formulas into a new sheet, like we need to in Sheets and in, in online Excel to get the um, numbers to work right, you might need to do that. So just to be aware of it, that's the new trick for those of you who remember Excel. Um, then the other thing we're going to look at is, let's see, which one did I, this was, I'm gonna just clear the rest of these data sets. So we're just looking at the simple tails for the finding the integral of. Um, if we wanna find the integral of, of this function, like we wanna know what the, the ratio is, the mole fraction for these 
Um, basically, we just add another column that's basically going to be our rectangle area. So every rectangle is going to have a dx times a height. And the way we do that is, is basically you say, okay, usually we go, we say um, we want to look at dx as being a change in time, right? And so we can't start with a change in time initially. We would have a box with zero width. So we have to start in one row, but then we can literally just say, okay, our dx, we can even make to make this really obvious. You can do, you can combine some of these. We can make a dx column. dx is just this number minus the number right above it, right? Rs are all equally spaced from each other, but that doesn't, that's not necessarily true of every instrument. Some instruments that take things perspective to time have some randomness to how often they're able to take a sample. And so rather than have, I'm um, just say it's 0.25 over 60, um, we can just say it's the difference between these two points is our dx. And then from that, we have dx, our height is just gonna be this value. Except that that is going to make things a little bit weird because we had sort of a baseline, right? It wasn't zero. So a lot of times what you'll do to clean up your data is basically subtract off the baseline. So, so let's call this our signal minus baseline. And just say, okay, I'm just gonna define my baseline somewhat arbitrarily as the first Y value that we have recorded. So our signal minus the baseline is this value minus this value. But when we copy and paste, we don't want that to get that second one to get copied with it, right? So normally, so here, our dx, we, we want both of these shut cells to shift when we copy and paste, right? So we should be good to just copy this formula. Copy this formula, go down to the bottom, select the whole column, hit paste. There's our dx. And each one of these is just time for that data point minus the previous time. Makes sense, right? Final minus initial or final up to that point minus the point right before it. This one, if we copy and paste it, then it's gonna get really weird with the height when we start getting actual signal, right? So we want our baseline amount to stay the same. So who remembers how to do that? You want something to stay constant when you copy and paste the formula. You can just throw the number in. There's one way to do it. Just do E3 minus 58. Yeah. Be pretty close. The other way to do it um, is you use uh, dollar signs. A dollar sign means that you don't want that variable to change when you copy and paste it. In the keyboard shortcut, if you've got if you've got the F keys on your keyboard, um, hitting F4 automatically puts dollar signs in. So using dollar sign E, dollar sign two means that when you copy and paste it, it's always going to be whatever the new data point is minus E2. If you don't have the F4 key on your keyboard, just put dollar sign E, dollar sign two, or whatever your data set looks like. So now when we copy and paste, and you can tell this is not a, not a super robust computer computationally, um, because this isn't even that big of a data set. We're, we're stressing it right now by making it do a thousand data points at a time. Um, so now we have our DX value. We have our height above baseline. So our area for each of the individual rectangles is just going to be those two numbers multiplied against each other. DX times the height. And we can copy and paste that one as well. And this one area of the individual boxes is not super useful, right? Integrals are useful once you add those all up for a certain section. So now all we want to do is we want to say, okay, I want to start the, I want the integral from 
here to here. And when you go to your chart, I can just look at it. When you click at that point, then hover over it. Usually, just get used to. Um, and you can just right click once you select just one data point, you can say add data label and it'll tell you. And you have to mess with, yeah, this is all changed a little bit. Um, we want the X value. Oh, not for the whole, not for all of them, just one. The, the other way you can do it is you can kind of eyeball it or zoom in on it. I know that's a lot of data points on <laughs> Control Z is your friend. <laughs> Again, remember where control is and get your keyboard <laughs> chart does. Um, you can sort of eyeball it or you can go down on here and you can just go until you start seeing, like it was close to one minute, right? So go down close to one minute and you find where your numbers start to jump. So like right there. It's at 58, starts climbing maybe a little bit, but not very much, but then it jumps up to 80 to the 60s and 85. All of our baseline were in the high 50s. So this is the start of our peak. Um, there's definitely a way to add just one data point in a way that'll show you the X value, but it's it's working for mine. Yeah, it's it's just this particular installation of Excel. It's not usually if you hover your mouth, there it is. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> Um, so our peak goes from where it first started jumping until 1.175. We call that the end of the first peak. So if we want the integral of the first peak, we just add up all the boxes between when it starts changing and, and uh, 1.175. And this is one where, so I want to say here, I would usually just set it up down here, so it's a pilot of our chart. Area one, we're just gonna say equals sum, and we go down to where it started changing fast, right? So here, and then hold shift, and go down until you get to our X value of 1.175, right? Having some scratch paper around can be helpful, so you don't need to remember all that. What the what was the second data point I was looking for, right? There's area one and units that don't really mean anything, but when we compare them to the total, the area for peak two then is going to start at the same spot as start the next data point. And then we're just going to say, I don't know, take it until it gets close to back to baseline. Oh, so don't click on it to select just one data point. Just hover your mouse over it, at least for this version. To call that 3.1125 minutes. So equals sum. I know we're we're over, but just to finish this last bit of one point one seven five is right there, and I said what three three eleven twenty five three eleven twenty five. Um, the other thing you can do is, is um, you can hold page down and shift works just as well as arrow down, so you can go a few can go a little faster if you just use the page down. 311, you said? 25? Yeah, 311. Now we have our two areas. And so we want the mole fraction of one. It's just the area of peak one divided by the total area of both peaks. So equals this number divided by this number plus 
that number. So tails for um, for the simple distillation, the mole fraction in the of compound one is 0.26. Considering we started with about 50-50, we definitely came up with something that was more concentrated in compound one at the end, or sorry, more concentrated in compound two. And then for to get mole fraction two, it's a two component system. You can just do equals one minus that, or you can do the same math and say equals this number divided by this plus this. And get 74%. So you went from 50 50 to 74% um, by mole. So definitely shows that we had a difference. And if we plot the two on top of each other, the simple and the tail and the, or the heads and the tails for the simple, we would see an initial peak that's way bigger in area for, for compound one, and the second peak that's way smaller for compound two. Um, and we, if we did the same math, we wind up doing that. And so this is the fastest way to find the integral. If you have enough data points that you can say dx is really small, just do it like this. No calculus needed. You just need to know what the concept is. You knew it had calculus, otherwise, we'd say, oh, we're going to use the box method to approximate. That doesn't make any sense, right? Um, and if any of you don't remember the box method and that didn't make any sense, let me know and we can go over that little bit of review to just what the logic is there. Um, I realize that. At this point, I was assuming that everybody <laughs> remembered the box method from finding an integral in the first place. If that's not the case, just let me know. Um, and I think that's that's what you need to know. That's the trick to to cleaning up the data and getting an integral for it. There are function there are programs in a lot of places um, hooked up to these these instruments where it'll just let you click the beginning of your peak and the end of your peak and it'll integrate it for you. Um, it is, but at the same time, it's just doing this automatically. It just has a button that says integrate peaks and you just define your peaks by clicking the beginning and the end of each of them. We're just doing it by hand to show how it all works. So I think you do this anyway, the first time we had that program. All right, any other questions on this for now? To, to give you another chance to ask questions on Tuesday, um, we'll say that the due date for this for this lab is not until next Thursday. So you have next Tuesday to use office hours and lab time. Um, what, it's going to be another to set it up and then watch it boil sort of lab. Um, so you'll have some time with me if you're hung up on any of the specifics, getting the formulas written, but logic at least. Hopefully it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay.